as we try to find a rhythm amongst the noise of this world, tuning the strings of our soul to feel we have a place in this orchestra of life. We find sometimes that we get lost amongst the oceans of sound. We dance and move our way through it all and find meaning, just trying to fit into this place and the people around us. Doing this on our own, we find we lose the rhythm. It is only through the grace of God we truly find our place in this world. When we walk alongside Christ, He fills us with purpose. Only then we truly find our rhythm as we join in His orchestra. We learn to move in sync with God and His plan for us all. Letting God use us, the noise of this world becomes faint and the rhythm of God becomes clear. When I, when I think of All Saints Sunday, I think of the people that have gone on before us uh, that have such an impact in our lives. I, I have this image of this verse from the book of Hebrews that says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, so I'm uh, uh, that, that image because they're, they're up in a rafters, they're, they're coming down, they're supporting us, and they're cheering us on. So let me read the whole scripture, Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's kind of, today is sort of like a family reunion, isn't it? That uh, today that we pull out our old photographs, or some of you still have your photographs and albums, or pull out the old photograph albums, or remember... Remember where we came from. That's what we do here today. Uh, the pictures it will include figures from the Bible, from our Wesleyan heritage, like John Wesley and Francis Asbury, and from our own church history. And as United Methodists, we don't officially canonize the saints like the Catholic Church do, but we share these people. They belong to us, and we belong to them. Now, some would just say, why go on and talk about this old stuff? Why do we have to bring out these old photographs and get them out again? Because they, well, there seem to be old stories and, uh, about people from bygone years that makes the church seem kind of old. Ministers stand up here and tell these stories about these old people. We're hearing these clothes that, that uh, we're in stolen a robe and, and Western men stop wearing these in the 5th century. But the ministers still wear them uh, on Sunday morning. And it's a little wonder to hear people say that the church is going to get, its, if it's going to get its act together, speak to the modern world, modernize itself, then the old church is going to have to get with the times. But on this day, there is something to be said for not getting with the times. We have these rich traditions for us that we lean on, these traditions in the church that are not traditions that narrow our focus, yet wide and large and enrich us the scope of our vision. We, we tend to listen to only the voices of our own consciousness or those who we find around us. Our society has become much too like this. We only watch news shows that share the news the way we agree. We follow people on social media that have the same views that we have. And if our decisions are guided only by what is the newest and the trendiest, then the world will find itself walking around in, the world will find itself walking around in, it's going to be a very narrow-minded world. Sometimes we need to hear these old stories of the old saints to shake us loose again. He was born like many of us in a family that had plenty to be thankful for, never great, greatly in need. His father was a wealthy merchant. He had good looks, nice clothes, was popular around his circles, a good education. But as an adult, he couldn't really say that he had found the good life. His name was Francis Bernadette. One day he was riding his horse down the lane of the countryside and passed a leopard covered with terrible sores. He was repulsed by the sight of the man. He spurred his horse on, but as he did, he flung one gold coin 
just to kind of ease his conscience. But a few paces down the road, he was overwhelmed by a sudden inexplicable compassion. He turned his horse around, came back, got off his horse, and emptied his pockets of all the gold coins that he had to, uh, to, the, that he had to the leper. And then overcoming his revulsion, he hugged the man. That moment was the beginning of the call. He left his wealth and career, and now we know him as St. Francis of Assisi, for whom the current Pope, Pope Francis, took his name. You hear a story like that in the church, and it can be challenging and unsettling. When you hear these old stories in the church of men and women who could, wouldn't settle for those little thing, list of options given to us by the status quo, but were willing to listen to the options given to them by God. When you hear the stories of the saints, you might as well settle in, loosen your collars, because there's no telling where you'll be by the end of the service. That's why we need to hear these old stories. We are linked with history and the past, and we're reminded of that reality that, believe it or not, none of this started with us. The author Maya Angelou said, we've all been paid for. Every time we come into the church, we have this sense of the forebearers sitting on the perch, cheering us on, staring at us. People from the Bible like Abraham and Sarah and Ruth and Jacob and Mary. The saints of the early church. The saints of this church that are gone and for what they paid for in the past is why we are here today. We are surrounded by a great multitude, as the book of Revelation says. We are just a part of the divine story that started long before we got here will continue long after we are gone. That is richer and broader than our own little personal bit part in the story. One of the best preachers who ever lived was the who one who could really spin a story was the late Fred Craddock who taught preaching at Candler Seminary in Atlanta. He tells the story of going back to his old country church that he grew up in and observed how things had changed. There were all these beautiful windows that he didn't remember when he was a kid. And he went around and he looked at the names that are on the plaques below the windows and he didn't recognize one of them. So he struck up a conversation with one of the members about how things had changed, that the church had grown, and how he didn't know anyone's name on those new windows. The church member said, oh no, those aren't members of this church. You see, it's interesting how we got those windows. They were made for another church in St. Louis by this artist in Italy, but when they when they received the windows to their church, they realized that the, the, uh, the, they were six inches too narrow to fit in the windows. So the artist in Italy apologized and said he could make them some new ones. But he asked if they would advertise as if they could sell the first set of windows. Well, we ended up getting them at a great price. So my friend said, well, why don't you take the names off those windows since they're not members of your church? And the man said, well, we talked about it. And he even had a couple board meetings to talk about, to discuss it. And we were going to take them off. But then we realized that we're just a country church in a small town. Nothing really changes around here. Nobody hardly ever moves away. It's always the same people you see around town. So we said, let's leave the names on. Because it's kind of nice to come here on Sunday morning and be surrounded by the names of people other than ourselves. That's... Really what happens to us when we come here on Sunday mornings. We may not know the names of the people that helped build this church. We may not know the names of the people that, that uh, helped uh, started this community. But the author of Hebrews says we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. We can almost hear them egging us on. Shouting encouragement to us. Every once in a while we need to take out those old family photos. Ever so often to widen the spectrum of our vision. And something else happens to us when we get those old photos out. They remind us that those people aren't really so much different than us. As we look at the characters in these stories, the ones we call the saints, we begin to realize that these people have the same struggles, have the same faults, have the same imperfections that we and everybody around us has. We may think all saints as those people that are all stars or all pro or all league. But we find out that God doesn't seem to prefer the Superman or the Marvel heroes or the Wonder Women. But God seems to prefer the Clark Kents and the Peter Parkers and the Lois Lanes, the lowly types, the fumbling types, people like you and me. 
you dig into the stories of the people that we call saints, and what do you find? That these people aren't the extraordinary ones, but rather the ordinary ones. But somehow their extravagant love for God enabled them to do some extraordinary things. Now, if that's the case, it means that we can't just shrug our shoulders and say that sainthood is is impossible for us. Because the blood that runs through the veins of the ones they call saints is the same blood that runs through us, the blood of Christ. And the light that was in them is the same light that was within us, too. These stories remind us that we, me and you, belong to this company. Just about anybody could be a saint. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to be dead. You just have to be the kind of person that God created you to be. To love as God loved. To throw your arms around the world and to shine like the sun, the light of Christ. Earlier you heard some names that were read. Saw the faces of persons in the family that we lost this past year. And as they were read, you may know some of them and say to yourself, yeah, they were truly saints in my life. They were a saint to me. And think about the people that have meant the most to you. They aren't mega talented, overachiever, as much as they were often extraordinary in their willingness to put their beliefs into action. Now, the Catholic Church has a lengthy, elaborate process before they can canonize a saint, but just think about those people who have, have been saints in your life. They didn't have to take it undergo a lengthy, elaborate process to decide that they truly are saints. You just knew it. Because of their extraordinary willingness to put their beliefs into action, to spread around the love that God gave them so that others may appreciate it. We celebrate those who have left us and left us a legacy. Those that have inspired us, encouraged us, Showing us what faith is all about and how to put our faith into action. But what about us? What legacy are we leaving behind? What will we be remembered for? What will those who are close to us say about us after we're gone? Are we living the life now for which we will be numbered one of the saints? Are we running the race with perseverance, throwing off everything that easily entangles, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the perfecter of our faith? Is that what we will be remembered by? Or will we be remembered by something we're not very proud of? Well, it's not too early to start leaving a legacy. Live a life that will challenge or inspire others around you. One filled with extravagant love, unassuming humility, unquestionable character, wholesome integrity, and a person of great faith. Beliefs into actions. Seems such a simple thing. The author of the book of Hebrews reminds us of the perfecter of our faith. He says, make straight the paths of our feet. In other words, do what you can to get your convictions, your beliefs into your hands and your feet. Doesn't, doesn't that sound so simple? What's the problem? Maybe it's because it's so easy to confuse our convictions and our beliefs with our actions. If we are convicted and believe strongly, then that's enough, isn't it? Not to the saints. You know, the ones that take their convictions and put them into action. The real saints are the ones that say yes, not just with their heads and their hearts, but with their lives. They figured out what God needs is not those who say, believe, and stand up for the right thing. The world is full of those people. What God needs is some people who will go when God says go and do when God says says something has you something for you to do. Think about the saints in your lives. Most likely they are ordinary people with an extraordinary willingness to take belief and turn it into action. And an extraordinary willingness to make some promises that stretch out over the years to us. That we live now in legacy of, to persevere, to persist, to give their word and keep their word. They have given us an example to strive to, toward. Yes, we are surrounded by a great multitude of those who have gone before us. And on this day, we rejoice and say a word of thanks for those saints in our lives and the life of the church. And honor them by striving to do the same. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.